Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the story of Adolf Kors III. He also went by the name of Ad. Ad was the grandson of Adolf Kors Sr. who, back in 1873, founded a company in Colorado. Over many years, this company thrived and has become most commonly known as the Kors Brewing Company. Adolf Sr. was married to Louisa Weber and together they had eight children. Two of their children died in infancy, with the remaining six surviving to adulthood. The fifth born and third surviving child was Adolf Kors Jr. who was born in 1884. He would follow in his father's footsteps and became the second president of the Kors Brewing Company. Adolf Jr. and his wife Alice May Kistler had four children, the first of which was Adolf Kors III or Ad, who was born in 1915. In 1923, Adolf Sr. handed the business to Adolf Jr. and, despite the restrictions on brewing due to prohibition, the business had been cleverly diversified and as such was still thriving. It is said that Adolf Sr. was a deeply unpleasant and miserable person who was very cold towards everyone, including his own family. It would seem that despite their wealth, they were an extremely unhappy family. When Ad was just 14 years old, his grandfather, Adolf Sr., had been visiting Virginia Beach along with his wife of 60 years, Louisa. During this visit, 82-year-old Adolf Sr. took his own life by leaping from the sixth floor of the Cavalier Hotel. Five years later, in 1934, Ad's father, Adolf Jr., was subject to a kidnapping plot. Four men conspired to kidnap him for a ransom of $50,000. The plan was that the person delivering the money would proceed to three different checkpoints to ensure that they were not being followed and then they would split the cash. Adolf Jr. would then be released in Colorado Springs. However, when the Denver police were working on an unrelated auto theft case, they learned of this plot and when one of the would-be kidnappers was arrested on a separate charge, the kidnapping was foiled before it had even begun. Despite these difficult events in his life, Ad thrived at school. He attended the Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire and then graduated from Cornell University, just like his father before him. He was also athletically gifted, becoming a semi-professional baseball player. However, he soon followed both his father and grandfather into the family business and he became CEO and chairman of the board of the Coors Brewing Company. Ad seemed to be well liked by those who knew him. He was a friendly, popular man who, despite being the heir to a multi-million dollar company, preferred to live a relatively simple life on a ranch with his wife Mary and their four young children. Thursday the 9th of February 1960 started like any other morning for Ad. He left home at approximately 8am heading towards the brewery for a 9am conference meeting. A short while into his journey, he saw a yellow Mercury sedan broken down at the side of the road. Ad stopped to help this driver in trouble and soon disappeared without a trace. Shortly afterwards, not long after the time that Ad had left for work, a passing vet noticed Ad's truck on the bridge over Turkey Creek but, at that time, thought very little of it. Three hours later, at approximately 11am, a milkman travelling along this same bridge sounded his horn several times to get the attention of the driver of a truck blocking the bridge. When there was no response, the milkman went to investigate, finding that the vehicle was empty but with the engine still running and the radio playing. The milkman decided to move the vehicle himself, noticing that there was a reddish-brown stain on the seat. He then reported the vehicle to Sheriff Art Wormuth's office at Golden, Colorado, who quickly determined that the truck belonged to Ad. At the end of this Cause family story, I'm going to tell you a side story about Sheriff Art Wormuth. Upon inspection, traces of blood were found, not only on the front seat of the truck, but also on the road nearby and part of the bridge railing. 
A baseball cap and glasses belonging to Ad were found by the edge of the water under the bridge. They also appeared to have blood on them. The next day, the FBI were called to help Colorado authorities with the case. Following the disappearance of their son, Adolf Kors Jr. and his wife flew back from their Hawaiian vacation, stating that money is secondary. The main thing is to get our son back alive. The Kors family were convinced that Ad had been kidnapped and fully agreed to pay the ransom if asked to do so. Sometime later that day, Ad's wife Mary received a ransom note. The note was typed and it read as follows. Mrs. Kors, your husband has been kidnapped. His car is by Turkey Creek. Call the police or FBI, he dies. Cooperate, he lives. Ransom, $200,000 in tens and $300,000 in twenties. There will be no negotiating. Bills, used, non-consecutive, unrecorded, unmarked. Warning, we will know if you call the police or record the serial numbers. Directions, place money and this letter and envelope in one suitcase or bag. Have two men with a car ready to make the delivery. When all set, advertise a tractor for sale in Denver Post Section 69. Sign Ad King Ranch, Fort Lupton. Wait at NA 9-4455 for instructions after the ad appears. Deliver immediately after receiving call. Any delay will be regarded as a stall to set up a stakeout. Understand this, Adolf's life is in your hands. We have no desire to commit murder all we want is that money. If you follow the instructions, he will be released unharmed within 48 hours after the money is received. With the help of law enforcement, Mary followed the instructions as outlined by the kidnapper. She placed the advertisement and waited for further instructions, but none came. Both local law enforcement and the FBI continued to pursue leads and analyze evidence, but there was still no trace of an ad. It was found that the ransom note had been typed on paper which had an uncommon watermark using a distinct typeface. Useful information, but still not enough to bring the authorities any closer to solving the case. As a result of extensive interviewing, the search became focused on a bright yellow mercury that had been seen in the local area on a number of recent occasions. Authorities learned that the owner of the vehicle was a man called Walter Osborne. Upon investigation, the FBI learned that Walter had also disappeared at the same time as Ad. In addition, just before his disappearance, Walter had obtained a gun, handcuffs and a typewriter. The FBI then also found that Walter Osborne was actually an alias for Joseph Corbett Jr. Joseph was a 31-year-old convicted murderer who had escaped from a minimum security prison four years earlier. He immediately became the prime suspect in Ad's kidnapping. The FBI obtained a warrant for his arrest and he was placed on the 10 most wanted fugitives list soon after. Shortly after his disappearance, the torched remains of Joseph's yellow mercury were found by law enforcement in a dump in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The trail for Joseph remained cold throughout the summer but tragically, the trail to Adolf Kors ended in September 1960. On September the 11th, some hikers came across a discarded pair of trousers in the Rocky Mountains near Sedalia, which was south of Denver. The trousers had a keyring showing the initials AC the third. A detailed search of the area then followed, and on September the 15th, other items of clothing, along with skeletal remains, were found. A jacket and shirt that had belonged to Ad had bullet holes that showed he had been shot in the back. Further analysis of his shoulder bone confirmed this. From all the evidence collected, it appeared that Joseph had the kidnapping carefully planned. He had intended to kidnap Ad, take him to a remote location, camp for a few days until he got the money and then disappear. What Joseph hadn't anticipated was Ad putting up a fight. It appears that there was a struggle on the bridge, and when Ad made a run for his vehicle, Joseph panicked and shot him twice in the back. Due to the high-profile nature of the victim, the case remained in the public eye and featured in many publications. Joseph's wanted photograph sparked interest and leads across America. 
But ultimately, it was magazine readers in Canada who provided an end to this case. Initially, a man advised the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the FBI about a man who had recently rented an apartment who bore a striking resemblance to Joseph. Upon further investigation, this man had already moved on. The next day, the manager at a rooming house in Winnipeg advised local police that a man who looked like Joseph had recently stayed at her house and advised that he was driving a red Pontiac. The information was well publicised across Canada and on October the 29th, 1960, a police officer reported a similar vehicle that was parked outside of the Maxine Hotel in Vancouver. Soon, the local police and FBI headed to the hotel room. When they knocked at the door, Joseph simply answered, I give up, I'm the man you want. He was returned to Colorado where he was tried for the murder of Adolf Kaur III. There was a mountain of evidence against him, including the ransom notes and the burned out mercury. Joseph was convicted of first degree murder on the 29th of March 1961 and he was sentenced to life in prison. In 1980, at the age of 51, he was released on parole for good behaviour. He served just 19 years of his sentence for the brutal murder of Adolf Kors III. After release, Joseph lived a reclusive lifestyle, firstly working in a manufacturing plant and later driving a truck for the Salvation Army. He continued to protest his innocence and lived his remaining years less than 10 miles from the scene of the murder. The final life that Joseph Corbett took was his own. Following his diagnosis with cancer, he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to his head on the 24th of August, 2009 at the age of 80. He left no notes and no one claimed his body. Just one more bit of additional information. In 1975, Ad's widow Mary Cause died aged 60 when she fell down a flight of stairs in Aspen, Colorado. Thank you for listening about the Cause family curse. I did say I would tell you more about the sheriff, Art Wormuth, who featured in this story. It turns out he had a truly action-packed life. Arthur William Wormuth Jr. was born on the 3rd of May 1915 in South Dakota. He was then raised in Chicago's Lakeview neighborhood. His hometown during World War II was listed as Traverse City, Michigan. His father was a doctor and a World War I veteran who passed away in 1937 and his mother was Clara Natalie Lorenz. His sister Natalie was a professional dancer in Chicago in the 1940s using the stage name Talia. Wormuth was a graduate of Northwestern Military and Naval Academy in 1932. He was an athletic youth and participated in many sports at the academy, including football, track and baseball. His teammates nicknamed him Satch. He graduated from North Park College and Loyola University. At Loyola University, he received a Bachelor of Science in Bacteriology. Wormuth was married to Jean Wilkins of Chicago from June 1, 1935 until they divorced in 1947. Then, during World War II, he served in the infantry reserves as a second lieutenant and was stationed near Walters Meet, Michigan. It was during this time that he learned wilderness survival skills. He was eventually promoted to captain in 1941 after the invasion of the Philippines and was one of a handful of Americans in the primarily Filipino 57th Infantry Regiment of the Philippine Scouts. On January 5, 1942, Wormuth organised a group of 185 Filipinos into a group that became known as Suicide Snipers. They were set up to counter enemy infiltration behind the American lines. Over the next three weeks, he and his force claimed over 500 enemy killed while losing 45 of its own. He was shot in the leg while on a successful mission to destroy a bridge and to burn an enemy encampment. On February the 3rd, he was shot in the left breast and was carried back to receive treatment. Twelve days later, he left the medical facility without permission and rejoined his battalion. In early April, he fell down a ravine 
and was seriously injured on a large boulder. He woke up in field hospital number two as it was being overrun by Japanese forces. Wormuth received the Distinguished Service Cross for his actions in January 1942. He became known as the One Man Army of Bataan and he was widely credited with over 116 kills. He also received the Silver Star and three Purple Heart decorations. Now to his time when he was in captivity. His injuries forced him to remain in a Japanese hospital until May 25th, 1942, when he was transported to New Bilibid prison. His injuries spared him from the Bataan death march. After Bilibid, he was sent to Lipa City, Batangas, and placed in charge of a 500-man work detail to construct a runway. As they were building this, his crew deliberately sabotaged the runway so that it buckled under the weight of landing bombers. His injuries forced him to be sent back to Bilibid in January 1943. Eventually, he was operated on in April 1943 by an American surgeon who was also in captivity. In June 1943, he was sent to Cabanatuan to join a farming detail. In January 44, his detail was working to the point where men started collapsing whilst working. When he demanded that the Japanese commander take it easy on his men, he received a severe beating, damaging his kidneys and again sending him back to a hospital. On October 13, 1944, he was transferred back to Bilibid until December when he boarded the hell ship Oriaku Maru as one of 1,620 prisoners. Because the prison ship was unmarked, it was bombed December 15, 1944 in Subic Bay by aircraft from the USS Hornet, who mistook it for a troop transport. This action ended up killing several hundred prisoners of war. Wormuth survived the bombing and was transported by boxcar to San Fernando. 160 men were placed in his car and as there was no room to move or sit, were forced to stand for the duration of the 26-hour trip. According to Wormuth, the man beside him died on his feet and was held in place by the crowd for the rest of the trip since there was no room to remove the corpse. Wormuth then received his fourth Purple Heart due to the injuries sustained when the bombers from the USS Hornet attacked his boat. Then he was transported to Japan, then to Korea, then to Mukden, where his prison camp was liberated by the Russians in August 1945. When he was found, he weighed 105 pounds, or 48 kilograms, seven and a half stone. He previously weighed 190 pounds, or 86 kilograms, earlier in the war. Wormuth then returned to the United States on the transport SS Marine Shark, arriving November 1st, 1945, in San Francisco. On his return, he modestly credited the Filipino scouts for many of his exploits, saying, 90% of the credit for what I did was due to them. They're the best soldiers in the world. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Shortly after the war ended, Olivia Josephine Oswald, a Filipino nurse, claimed to have married Wormuth on December 7, 1941, on the rooftop of the Great Eastern Hotel in Manila, though this was actually disputed by Wormuth. His divorce to Jean was finalised June 4, 1947, and the same day he married Patricia Steele, a 23-year-old parachutist from Denver, Colorado. He and Patricia then adopted an eight-year-old named David, about 1956. I also found that he remarried in 1960 to Julia Bowers, who he eventually divorced, 10th of July 1977. Going back to 1948, Wormuth was elected the Marshal of City Court in Wichita, Kansas, and subsequently arrested L. Ron Hubbard in 1951. He was then appointed Sheriff of Jefferson County, Colorado, by county commissioners in 1957, following the indictment and resignation of Sheriff Enlow for federal income tax evasion. Wormuth resigned as sheriff on May 1, 1962, in lieu of prosecution on an embezzlement charge, and was then replaced by Harold E. Bray. As sheriff of Jefferson County, Colorado, Wormuth led searches for and investigated the disappearance of Coors Brewing Company CEO and heir, Adolf Coors III, within his county. He died 13th of June, 1981, aged 66, 
His burial took place at Southern Nevada Veterans Memorial Cemetery at Boulder City in Nevada. So that was why I felt it was important to share about his history, often referred to as the one-man army of Bataan. I know that some of you will have heard the Adolf Kors the third story before, but I decided to remake it as there were quite a few recording issues in the original. If you did want to listen to the original one, there will be a link in the description. Thanks very much for listening to that case, and thanks to Wikipedia for supplying that detail in this circumstance. As usual, please add any comments down below, and thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. The Coors Brewery is the largest in the world. It's the one at Golden, Colorado, and has a capacity of 22 million barrels of beer. Goodbye.